And welcome to day seven of Vid 21. I had to just do a quick mental count there. I lost track of how many days we've been. But we are day seven of Vid 21, wherever you are joining from in the world. Welcome. And um, if you are in Melbourne, uh, good morning and uh, welcome back. It is great to have you. We are joined this morning by the wonderful Sharon Natoli. Um, she is an amazing um, woman who's here to talk about self-talk mastery. She, through her engaging presentations, Sharon connects, informs and inspires audiences, helping them move from stuckdom to freedom by conquering their inner critic and igniting the power of their voice. She is passionate about helping people fuel their inner spark and live life fully self-expressed, making the contribution they were born to make. She is visionary, thought-provoking and engaging and shares stories, content and case studies that will enable you to gain a deeper understanding of how you lead yourself, your people and your organization toward a better future. And uh, Sharon, welcome, it's great to have you here. I know we have spoken quite a bit over the last 12 months, particularly about inner voice and self-mastery. I can't wait to, to hear you take us through this and uh, yeah, I'll hand over to you and uh, looking forward to enjoying this. Thanks, thanks very much, Julia, and um, thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts with everyone this morning. And thanks everyone for joining um, for joining me the, to, today to listen to um, how we can conquer our inner critic and really ignite the power of our voice, which is really uh, an important part of living life fully self-expressed and being able to influence the direction that we want to go in. And so today, what I um, thought I would do, because we are kind of an intimate little group, um, is to actually make it quite interactive and to do a little bit of a diagnostic. So getting to really know the voice in our head and what I call kind of the advisory board that may be purposefully or not so purposefully appointed. So I'd love for you to just grab a piece of paper, just one piece of paper, one A4 paper and a pen, uh, because we're going to draw ourselves a diagnostic and work through that over the next uh, half hour or so and or your iPad and a pen if that's what you prefer. So just to get that ready. But I'd like to really start with one of my favourite quotes, which is by Joyce Meyer, who's an American author and speaker. And she said that words are containers of power. And I think that we kind of know and feel that that's, there's truth in that because when it comes to like relationships, words like I love you or I forgive you or will you marry me uh, have the potential, of course, to change the direction of our life. And similarly at work, you know, words of encouragement can really lift us and make a difference to our engagement. So if someone says, you know, hey, Julia, I really love how you did that project. Um, it's such, so great to have you on our team. You're such an asset can really you know, lift us and, and really give us that, that spark um, that we need to stay engaged and to feel valued. And of course, um, speeches, whether that's by us as you know, people as leaders or politicians, celebrities, you know, speeches, of course, have the power to mobilise people to take action. And of course, we're seeing that now. We've seen that this week with the um, you know, March for Justice um, events that are happening. So speeches and words really do have power to influence. And so I guess what happens then if you struggle to speak up, you know, if you struggle to kind of say what you wanna say, what's on your mind, to kind of put your opinion forward, to contribute your ideas. Well, what happens is, of course, we don't have as much influence over the direction of our lives that we might like. And we can kind of then end up feeling what I call, you know, in stuckdom. Um, and, and that's not a great place to be because now, particularly, um, you know, where there's so much, I guess, content, so much messaging, so much information, we really want to be able to, you know, put forward our viewpoint, have our voice heard. And so being able to speak up is a really important part of influencing our lives. So if we can't do it, you know, like at work, we can feel like we may not be noticed. 
we may be overlooked if we're not contributing our ideas in meetings or you know putting our hand up asking questions when we don't when we want when we need to know something um, and certainly in relationships too if we're not uh, sharing what's on our mind if we're holding back and hesitating then people don't get to know us as well as what they might do otherwise if we're able to kind of really open up and share really what's going on for us and within ourselves too if we're not sharing um, our thoughts and holding back and hesitating then we can feel a little bit like you know our, our gut and our heart and our mind really aren't quite in alignment so we can feel a little bit I guess out of integrity within ourselves and a little bit um, you know not quite not fully self-expressed and living the life that we want and so it's really important to kind of have the, the, the ability to speak up and share what's on our mind. And it's not only those things, but um, Bronnie Ware, who's the author of a book called The Five Regrets of the Dying, who spent some time in with people in palliative care, asking them, you know, looking back on your life, what are the regrets that you have? And the number one regret um, of the dying was that people wished that they had more courage to live life on their terms and not the life that others expected of them. And so being able to speak up, to connect our thoughts and opinions and ideas with others um, and to use words as a source of power is really important um, across our life and probably one of the most important things that we can do. So, um, you know, sometimes I think that when we're having, when we're, we're looking for um, assistance to speak up, to really get our words out, that we can be told, well, it's just a matter of courage, you know, just have more courage and know that you matter, know that your opinion's valuable and just, you know, put yourself forward. And that's useful, um, except calling, having to call on your courage is kind of like requires a big effort. So if we have to do that every time we speak up, um, then it can kind of feel a little bit hard, but certainly um, building our courage is really important. The other thing that we can be told, um, you know, we can do training and be advised about, you know, here's some particular phrases that you might like to use to help you, or here's some sentence starters that might be valuable. And that's kind of a little bit like a Band-Aid approach because it's kind of touching the surface, but not really getting, um, you know, to the core of the matter. And the real core of what's happening when we're holding back in relation to sharing our opinions and speaking up is the voice in our head and that what we're saying on the inside is really what's influencing what we're saying on the outside. And there's um, a great book that I would recommend if you're really interested in this um, topic, and I'll just show it to you here. <clears throat> Oops, <clears throat> sorry, just go to screen share. Um, by um, Shrizad Chamin, and he wrote this book called Positive Intelligence. And it's a great book in terms of, he talks about, um, you know, the voices in our head as saboteurs and then the power of the sages. But he's also summarized some of the key research in relation to how the voices in our head and our internal dialogue influence what he calls positive intelligence. And what he's found is that when we can uh, influence the voices in our head, so we have, you know, the, the critics and, and what I call the companions, um, when we can turn down the volume of the critics and turn up the sound of the companions, we're influencing, we, we're moving towards what he calls positive intelligence. And when we do that, and we're able to kind of tip that balance in the right direction, then we can increase our performance by 31%. We can become three times more creative. And if we're in a sales role, we can sell, our sales will increase by 37%. So some really um, strong numbers there, <clears throat> excuse me. But also um, we are more likely to experience better relationships, um, to feel uh, you know, happier within ourselves and to be more socially connected. So some really good, I guess, benefits that have been measured in relation in, in the work that they have done. And he's, he's from Stanford University and has really looked uh, in detail at kind of getting that balance um, between the critics in our head and, and what he calls the sage powers <clears throat> and what I call the companions. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more. 
So um, <clears throat> what we want to do, uh, so today I'm, I'm going to, I guess, work through a little bit of a, a diagnostic so that we can look at what is the balance um, of the voices in our head in terms of the balance between those critics um, that we all have and then those companions and which ones are we really feeding. But <clears throat> before I do that, I just wanted to give you um, a little bit more info about me and Julia's given you a bit of a brief intro. Um, but um, so in terms of my career, really, I'm, I'm a communication expert. That's what my uh, whole working life has been about. And what I do now is I help women and leaders and teams dare to speak up and to help to develop those skills so that they can live, love and lead their life from the inside out, which really means leading and living with that feeling of authenticity and integrity and being able to influence our direction. But my, um, my interest or I guess my obsession with self-talk started um, many years before that when I was 10 years old um, and probably even before that. <clears throat> when my auntie gave me this diary, uh, um, which I called my diary, of course, covered it with this nice bright orange um, paper. And it started a bit of an obsession whereby I wrote in this diary, and this is a five-year diary, although I used it as a four-year diary because I had so much to say to myself about myself that I ran out of space um, for the last two years. But um, I wrote in here every day for four years without missing a day. So that's 1,460 conversations with myself about myself. And when I look at this diary and I reflect on some of the thoughts that I had, it really highlights how what we think in our head um, directs how we live our life. And just to give you an idea, I'm not sure if you can see that, but this is what, um, what our thoughts, self-talk, um, looks like on paper. So there's um, sort of 1,460 um, conversations in there um, that I've had. So um, lots of self-talk. So I've got um, uh, so I'm, I've got expertise in self-talk, and the mastery part will probably be an ongoing um, an ongoing uh, challenge for me over my life. And so today I want to share some of the insights I've had and some of the things that have been helpful in relation to managing the thoughts in our head. And it's not surprising that maybe self-talk may look a little bit like that, which is kind of very, very blurby um, because research shows that we have, and this is research was published last year, every day we have around 6,200 thoughts that go through our mind. And so that works out to be about eight to nine thoughts um, a minute. And so while I've been explaining maybe my diary to you, um, you may have been thinking a number of other things at the same time, and maybe your concentration has gone off somewhere else. And that's not surprising. And in fact, other research shows that we do, um, in terms of um, our focus in our day, we spend about a third to half of it um, thinking these other thoughts. And so for half of our time, we're kind of thinking about other things. We're not living in the present. Um, and so um, what we need to do in terms of, I guess, mastering our self-talk or what's really helpful is to think about, first of all, how can we raise our awareness? So to go from, I guess, you know, if we think about 6,200 thoughts a day, just going through our mind and, and, and as thought worms, then it can be very overwhelming um, as a number. And that certainly can feel like that, that if we're not aware of those thoughts, we can be a little bit like a puppet on a string being kind of pulled this way and that way and not really having control um, over our mood and our feelings and what we're saying. And so um, raising our awareness is the first step towards, um, you know, what I call self-talk mastery. So to go from just no awareness to awareness and then from there to really move into discovery and discovering well, what exactly are we saying to ourselves. Um, how is that influencing us and what are those voices and where do they come from? And then from there to go into explorer mode, which is really looking at, well, how can we address that? You know, what can we do to shift that balance from the critics to the more companions? And then from there, you know, get to self-talk mastery, which is the optimal place that we want to be. And so today I want to start um, at that place of awareness and discovery and kind of Work, work through with you um, how, how we can raise awareness, what are the voices in our head, what are they saying, and then discover where we might have strengths and where we might need, where, where it might be useful for us to kind of focus and work on. So I'd love for you to grab your piece of paper 
Um, so just, and your pen, yes. <laughs> and just start by drawing a circle um, on the page. So just a big, a big circle um, like that. <clears throat> and then, and then a medium circle and then a little circle. So you've got like a target. So it looks like that. Then once you've got those three circles, just divide them into quarters. So a horizontal and a vertical line, looking more and more like a target. And then once you've got that, just do a crisscross. So you, you're, um, you've got a pie. It can be your favorite pie. For me, that would be <clears throat> maybe lemon meringue pie. <laughs> Very nice, Julia. Very nice. All right. So this is what we're going to use as our little diagnostic. Now, the next thing to do is just to put a number one, two, three on the edges of the circle. So one, two, three. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we've got one, two, three going up there. And so the inner circle is our number one. The middle circle is our number two. And the outer circle is our number three. <clears throat> Then the next thing um, I'd like you to do is to name each of those pieces of the pie. Now, the ones above the horizontal line, these, these pieces up here, we're going to name as our companions. And the ones on the bottom, we're going to name as our critics. Now, I'm just going to show you, because it's easy for me to show you that on the slide, the names of the companions and the critics. So I'll just go back to here. So this is your pie, you've got the numbers, you've got the three circles and the crisscrosses. And now if you just go around and name each of those pies with those particular names. So I'm going to start with the critics and go kind of under and above. So the judge, the ruler, the avoider, the people pleaser, the warrior, the nurturer, the knower and the dancer. So just pop those names um, into each segment of your pie. And it is a pie because we're going to work out how, 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 which, which of those companions and critics we're feeding the most. So which ones are getting the biggest pieces of the pie? <clears throat> so hopefully you've got that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe each of these. So I'm going to describe the critics and the companions and just work through them. And I'm going to ask you three questions within each of those segments for each of those characters. And they're just yes, no questions. And whenever you have a yes answer, what I'd like you to do is color in a piece of the pie. So for example, if I ask you a question about the dancer and your, your answer is yes, colour in the red segment. And then this, for the second question, if the answer is also yes, colour in the yellow. And then if the third um, answer is yes, colour in the orange. And if you answer no, then you don't colour in anything at all. So by the end, we'll have coloured in segments um, representative of the strength of the critic and the companion uh, in your head. And we'll be able to see um, you know, which ones you're feeding the most. Any questions on that? It'll make sense? Cool. Okay. All right. So I'd like to introduce you to the first critic. Now I'm going to start with the critics because I want to finish with the companions. We want to finish on a high. Um, so we'll start with the underminers and finish with the elevators. <laughs> all right. So I'd like to introduce you to the first inner critic that we all have. And this is the judge. So this is the um, piece of the pie in the bottom left. Now the judge um, or the critics overall are um, voices in our head that can kind of pull us down, criticize us, condemn us, make it harder for us to really speak up and to influence the direction of our life. And so the judge can be, I guess, a little bit like, you know, um, a judge on one of those reality TV shows like uh, MasterChef or, you know, Idol or one of those, except the difference is that the judge is not it is not external, the judge is inside our head. And the judge judges ourselves against some kind of criteria or ideal that we have for ourselves or and our lives. And it also judges others and it judges our circumstances. So the voice of the judge may sound a little bit like, oh, um, you know, uh, Natalie just got a new job and you don't, your job's not quite as good as hers. So you've got to step up, you've got to do better. Or it might say something like, 
you know, you're not contributing um, in the meeting. You've got to really step up and do better. Uh, so the judge is kind of, it's evaluating us as better than, worse than, inferior, superior. So it's kind of trying to place us somewhere um, amongst uh, and against the criteria that we will have for our life and our expectations that we have about our life. So three questions I have for you when you think about that voice in your head are the following. Um, so do you frequently compare yourself to others? So if the answer is yes, then colour in one of your little segments. If the answer is no, we just leave it. So that one's, do you frequently compare yourself to others? All right, now question two, do you often think your life is not where it should be? Do you have expectations that you should be, it should be somewhere else, you should be in another place, you should be doing another job, something like that. And the third question is, do you find yourself regularly judging other people? So you might say something like, oh, um, Kate's really slow at answering the phone. I don't know how she got a job here. <laughs> Anything like that. So any yeses, colour in the little segment of your pie. And as I say, we all have the judge voice. And in fact, um, in the book, Positive Intelligence that I showed you, um, uh, Shazad Shamin says that the judge is actually our master, um, master critic. All right, so the second character I'd like to introduce you to is this one, the ruler. So the ruler is the voice in our head that may represent a little bit of a school teacher kind of voice, um, a headmaster voice, maybe a, a strict religious instructor kind of voice. And it sets rules for ourselves. And this voice, if it's present, you may find your, if it's present in high amounts, you may find yourself saying things like, oh, I'm beating myself up, or I'm kicking myself, um, or, you know, you might set your alarm to get up at a particular time in the morning, like 6 a.m., to go to the gym and you sleep in and you go, oh, I should have got up and, got, and gone to the gym. I'm so lazy. So it has rules around how we should and must operate. So the voice of the ruler is one of shoulds and musts and I need to. So it's around rules that we might have picked up as we're growing up. Um, so it could be your mother's voice, your father's voice, your school teacher's voice, one of those. So three questions um, to get an idea about how strong the ruler's voice may be. Do you frequently use the phrases I should and I must? So if they're part of your vocabulary, this would be an, a, a bit of an inkling as to the presence of the ruler. Um, do you often feel frustrated with yourself? That, you, that is that you're wanting to do things, but you often find that you don't follow through. So a sense of frustration. Um, and do you find that you, and so the third question, um, do you tell yourself off when you don't do something you planned or wanted to? So any yeses, colour in your little pieces of the pie. I think she's such a good picture of a ruler. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the third uh, critic to introduce you to is the avoider. Um, and the avoider is like, the Pollyanna. So Pollyanna wants the world to be good all the time, is very overly optimistic. Um, and so this is a voice that says, it doesn't matter, let, let it go, um, avoids having hard conversations because it feels a bit unpleasant. Um, so it's a, it's a voice that will have you put things off and procrastinate particularly hard things, you know, let's put that in that basket and just wait till tomorrow. So the avoider waits for things to kind of blow over. Uh, so a little bit like a doona dive kind of approach. Um, let's just wait and let's stay in the, the realm of pleasantness and uh, happiness. <laughs> so the problem with the avoider, of course, is that it can have us feel as though you know, if we're not addressing things, it can actually end up building resentment and anger because things that are important just don't get addressed. So that's the, the challenge with the avoider and that's why it kind of falls into the, the, 
the realm of the critic. So three questions to check in as to maybe how strong is the avoider voice. Um, do you avoid or delay difficult conversations? So do you avoid having um, uh, or participating in those difficult and challenging conversations that you know will make a difference to you moving forward? So that yes or no. Um, second question, do you feel you are overly optimistic? Now I'm an optimist, I call myself an optimist. Um, so optimism is good, but not but overly optimistic to the point of avoiding the kind of hard things. And the third question is, do you frequently do the hardest things last? So in general, on your to-do list, are those hard things um, being pushed over from day to day to day? So being avoided, being uh, procrastinated on. Just jump in if you want me to repeat any of the questions. All right, and the final critic is the people pleaser. And the, this, is, this um, voice is perhaps a bit more like a con artist because the people pleaser voice is the one that has us believe that to be liked, to fit in, to belong, uh, we need to be pleasing others. And so it's a little bit of a con because as we know in reality, um, the way that we create strong relationships and the way that we do develop a sense of belonging is, is to open up and be vulnerable. And so the people pleaser is, is a little bit like, you know, a fussy auntie who will come to you and say, you know, uh, can I get you a hot drink? Do you need anything else? Are you still hungry? Can I, can I get you, a, you know, a warm rug? So a little bit like that. So the people pleaser um, has us feel like we can be a little bit, you know, inauthentic, as though people don't really know us that well, as though we're kind of hiding, you know, parts of us that are that are that we're holding back on. And so they can be the kind of feelings that may be present if the people pleaser is a strong voice in your head. So three questions for the people pleaser. Um, the first one is, do you often say yes? when you mean no or no when you mean yes. So to please others, we might compromise on our answers. Do you, so that's question number one. Do you often put the needs of others ahead of your own? And again, this is about balance. So do you, do you often um, put, put others' needs ahead of yours to, to the detriment of yourself? Um, and uh, you know, that, so that's, that, that's the key one there. Uh, number three, do you worry that expressing your own needs will drive others away? So do you please others um, to the detriment of yourself because you're afraid that if you say what you want, um, people won't like you or they won't stick around or that you'll drive them away? They'll think that you're selfish. Okay, so that's the people pleaser. All right, so that's done with the, the critics, the four key critics. So we've filled in the bottom part of our pie and moving on to the companions. So the companions are the voices in our head that can raise us up and elevate us and lift us. And what we're wanting to do is really turn up the volume of those voices. So there are, there are actually three key things to help tip the balance of the voices in our head. One is to get to know the critics, what they're saying, um, you know, and, and how that's influencing us and to be able to kind of create a separation from that so we can step back and observe it. And secondly is to raise the voice of the companions so that um, you know, we're, we're looking after ourselves, taking care of ourselves, and we're building our own courage from the inside out. The third thing, and I'm not talking about that so much today, but is mindfulness and being able to create connection between heart uh, between mind, heart, body, um, so that we're feeling, um, we, we're, we're able to really tune in to, to um, our thoughts and to be able to have that kind of calmness that really helps. So they're kind of three strategies. Um, so in terms of raising the volume of the companion, so the first companion I'd like to introduce you to is Wonder Woman, uh, sorry, the warrior who is um, epitomized and characterized by Wonder Woman, who's my favorite superhero growing up. Uh, and, and so the warrior voice is the voice in our head that does bring courage, strength, 
power. So the warrior voice will be present when you are in your moments of power, when you are speaking up, when you're uh, showing that courage to put your ideas forward, even though you may feel a little bit of fear. Yes, Nicole, Wonder Woman. <laughs> yeah, we all love Wonder Woman. As I start with Wonder Woman, and I actually love this image too. Strong. <laughs> so, um, so when so when you're when you are feeling that that kind of courage and that power, that's when you're in your Wonder Woman moments. And Amy Cuddy, you know, you many of you might be aware of her research where she talks about standing like Wonder Woman as a way to tap into our power. And so those power poses um, can be helpful as a way to raise our Wonder Woman voice. So um, three questions to assess how strong Wonder Woman, um, how, or how strong, sorry, I keep calling it Wonder Woman, or the warrior um, is within us, is do you feel you have presence in meetings and gatherings? So do you feel that frequently? So if that's a yes, colour that in. Second question, do you often stand up for yourself and others? So do you find that that comes um, easily to you? And the third question um, is, do you have clear boundaries that you also protect? So that's having boundaries. Now we can have boundaries in our head, um, but the other part of that is protecting them. So when people cross our boundaries that we actually stand up and we protect their boundaries. So that's question number three. So that's the first one, um, is our warrior voice. Now, the other thing actually about the companions um, is that we're not actually trying to find them from somewhere. These companion voices are within us. And what happens is a little bit like the superheroes, you know, like Diana, um, who's who is Wonder Woman, uh, was actually born with these powers, with this courage, with this strength, with these abilities. And they get covered over when she, you know, fits into society and she becomes Diana, um, you know, to fit into the, the, the kind of city living. But her powers are actually there underneath. And so it's the same for us. Those powers are within us. We don't need to go and find them. We just need to reveal them. And they can just get covered over by those critics that um, we kind of trained to, to, to kind of have, have in the foreground. And what we need to do is un, untrain ourselves and reveal the powers that we already have within. So Wonder Woman. Okay, so the next one is um, the nurturer. And I love this nurturer image because she's kind of like a cool nurturer. So the nurturer um, is our voice of, um, of compassion. So the nurturer um, is, our, is, is the voice that tells us to look after ourselves, to protect ourselves, to practice self-love and self-care. And so this voice um, is present when we go, oh, yeah, that's enough. I, I actually need to ask someone for help. Um, I'm getting you know, too snowed under. I need to look after myself. Um, that's something I've got to do. Or it's the voice that says, yeah, I've had enough work today. I'm going to leave a little. I've had. A, I've been working um, hard. I'm going to leave early today. I'm going to put my pen down, get away from my laptop, and go for a walk. So the nurture is all about self love and also about compassion um, for ourselves. And if we're practicing that, um, you know, research by Leeds University shows that the more self love and compassion we have. Not only do we look after ourselves, but it increases our capacity to look after others. And so that's a really, uh, I think, um, motivating reason to look after ourselves um, because that helps us to, to kind of be our best and look after others. So three questions um, for to tap into the presence and the power of your nurturer voice. Do you frequently plan time for yourself? So that's question number one. If that's a yes, colour in that piece of the pie. Question number two, uh, are you good at practicing self-compassion? So is that something that you do regularly? So that, that's opposite to a little, to what the ruler will do, which is like, you didn't get up this morning at 6 a.m. Um, so you're a bad person, you know, you're lazy. The voice of the nurturer would, would, would respond to that differently and say, oh, look, you had a late night. Um, that's okay. You can make, you can go for a walk later in the day, or just go tomorrow. Right? Different voices. 
Third question for the nurturer, do you ask for others' support when needed? So do you ask for help when you need it? And I was speaking to someone in my coaching program yesterday who has a big challenge around that because she was brought up with a message that she was strong um, and, and, you know, very strong. And so sometimes she feels, however, so she feels that and she does come across as a strong person, but sometimes you can't always maintain that strength and she does need to ask for help. And often people will just say, you're a strong person, you'll get over it. And so being able to, I guess, communicate that we do need help is really important. All right, the third um, companion that I'd like to introduce you to is what I call the Noah. And the Noah is characterized by Elsa from Frozen 2. I think this is kind of my favorite um, companion um, <laughs> because the Noah is our voice of intuition. It's the magic that we have within. It's, it's our deep knowing um, of who we are and what, we're, what our purpose is in, in life. And sometimes that deep knowing, um, that voice within, that intuition can get covered over by um, you know, facts and data and science and some of that, I guess, left brain stuff um, that's so prevalent in our lifestyle. And Elsa in Frozen 2, she hears a voice whisper to her at night and it gets her up. And what she does is she goes, oh, is that a voice or is that a ringing in my ear? You know, what is that? And Elsa has the courage to follow that voice um, and to go and explore further her truth. Um, and that's what the movie is all about. And so Elsa is my icon for the Noah. And I'd just like to, I think the Noah and the intuition, you know, and, and what um, has also been shown in terms of intuitive intelligence, you know, that, that if we do tap into our intuition, that it is a form of intelligence. And even Albert Einstein um, said that, you know, there's some Albert Einstein quotes around that. Um, so there, there is evidence that intuition and tapping into our intuition helps us with decision making and with our social intelligence and so on. But my favourite, um, I think, uh, the, the, the thing that captures in, uh, intuition, um, uh, I think, really nicely is a quote by Clarissa Pinkola Estes from women, the book Women Who Run With The Wolves. I'd just like to read that to you. She says, the modern woman is a blur of activity. She's pressured to be all things to all people. The old knowing is long overdue. She is the voice that says, this way, this way. With her as ally, as leader, model, teacher, we see not through two eyes, but the eyes of intuition, which is many eyed. When we assert intuition, we see ourselves like the starry night. We gaze at the world through a thousand eyes. And I love that idea of seeing the world through a thousand eyes because it just opens up infinite possibilities for us. And so my three questions um, for the presence of the knower um, in, as a voice in your head are these. Do you feel you are well connected to your intuition? So that's question number one. Question number two, do you act on your gut feeling? So intuition, another word for intuition is our gut feeling. Um, that thing that comes up that goes, yes, I want to do that. Do you act on that? And number three is, do you sit still? And what I mean by that is, do you have times where you just sit and breathe um, or times where you go outside and you're just in nature, you know, you're smelling, smelling the roses, you're touching the trees. Do you, do you pause during the day to take a breath? So do you sit still is question number three. All right. And our final companion um, is the dancer. And this is the dancer who's dancing um, with her ballet shoes through the cathedral. So the dancer is our sense of fun and joy and abandonment. Um, it's passion. Uh, it's letting our hair down. It's often present in social situations. It's our laughter. You know, it's our it's our ability to really relax and let go. And the, the dancer really is um, how we tap into joy. Um, and uh, so, and Brene Brown talks about joy as being one of our most vulnerable emotions. And so sometimes, you know, we can kind of hold back and not let ourselves experience that. And so the voice of the dancer is the one of passion and abandonment and fun and laughter. 
And so three questions for the dancer, the presence of the dancer. Uh, do you plan something fun to do each week? So do you have things built into your calendar that are fun? Question number one. Uh, question number two, do you, put your, do you put your holidays in ahead of time? So have you planned your calendar so that you've got those breaks built in? And question number three is, do you laugh frequently? So three questions for the dancer. <clears throat> All right. So <laughs> I haven't filled in a pie ahead of time, but now um, with your pie, so we've covered um, the critics and the companions. And so I don't know if you're happy to un, un, I don't show you on your video, but yes, what your pie looks like. Oh, thank you, Julia. Yes, excellent. <laughs> so, hi, Michelle. Oh, wow, that's a great, I love those colours. <laughs> excellent. I'm just throwing a little bit of colour, but. <laughs> Very good. So, so that looks like a great pie chart in terms of um, the results. So, if you found so the the more you the the more colours you've got filled in, the more you're feeding that critic or companion. And so, the ones that um, you've got the most like twos or threes, so the ones that have got the most colour or filled in, are the ones that you're feeding the most with your pie. And so what you can do is circle the names of those and that will give you an indication as to where, so on the one hand with the critics, which are the ones that you might benefit from addressing, get to know a little bit um, more closely, so explore and discover. And then with the companions, where are the gaps? So if there's no feeding um, of the companions, so if the piece of the pie for the companions is empty, um, then that's where we need to do more feeding. So circle, I guess with the, sorry, with the companions, circle the ones where there's no colour. Sorry, maybe didn't say, so yeah, circle the ones where there's no colour. And with the critics, circle the ones where there's more colour. They're the, they're, so they're the areas to work on. So with raising the companions, if they're empty, they need feeding and quieting the voice of the critics. If they're full, they need a bit of emptying. And so what I thought I'd do to kind of, if, you, if you're happy to, if you're um, wanting to, if you're kind of daring enough to, then what you can do is send me your list. Um, and I'm happy to provide you with some tips about how you can either turn up the volume of the companions or turn down the sound of the critics. Um, Cause that's, that's really the next step. So please feel free to do that if you'd like some follow up. Um, and my email address is Sharon at SharonNatoli.com. So happy to do that. So um, overall, um, you know, the voice in our head has a big role to play in terms of how we can direct and lead our lives. And that's a really important thing in terms of getting to the end of our life and feeling like we've lived a life that we love and the life that we imagined. And so um, working on this area, I think, is one of the ways that we can really grow not only the power of our voice, but certainly the power and the influence to lead our life in the direction that we want to go. So thanks very much, Julia, for the opportunity to share that. And I hope that was valuable and, um, and happy if there's any questions or comments.